Well, hey guys, welcome to Mercy Hill this morning. As you uh, kind of getting here and getting settled in, let me, let me do this. Before we dive into the sermon, let me give you guys just a quick update. Um, y'all have been hearing about this for a couple weeks now, and I want to make sure we understand kind of the why and exactly what's happening. Um, next week, <clears throat> August 21st, 20, the 21st and 28th, historically at Mercy Hill, um, kind of the, the true migration of college students is, is back. And, and also, it's not just that. It's just that the summer is kind of getting over. People are settling into the fall. A lot of people that have been visiting over the summer will sort of all start to come back at one time. That creates a bump in attendance. And so historically, what we've done really for the last couple of years is about this time, we really begin to push you guys, the congregation, to think about giving up your seat in the morning in order to come to the five o'clock service or whatever night service we have had so that you can open up room for new people in the morning. We know this, I checked this with our, with our uh, connections people. We know that about 90% of people that come and it's their first time, they come in the morning. And that's just natural. If I was going to a new church, I would come in the morning as well. That's just kind of what we think of uh, here traditionally in the South. Hey, you go to church on Sunday morning. And so that's what happens. They come check out our church on a Sunday morning. And when they do, if we have not created room for them, well, then there's nowhere for them to sit. It's crazy. It's jam packed. And I want you to think some of you are like, Hey, what's the problem with that? If it was your first time at a church or your first time in a long time, when you came in, you send an unavoidable message to people by having such a crowded room. That message is there's just not room for you here. Uh, maybe you should go somewhere else, try some, but, but here there's no room. We get calls every once in a while by churches that are growing and they say, hey, well, what do you guys think about this? Or what do you think about that? One of the things I tell them is just an, a, a rule that I have learned over the last four years at Mercy Hill is that when the room is, is so full that people can't really sit down, it does send a message to new people. And that message is totally unintended, but they hear it loud and clear, which is there is no room for you here. And so about this time every year, we push everybody to the five o'clock service. I'm pushing you to the five o'clock service. I hope that there's any way, even if it's just for a season, you could commit to coming at night instead of in the morning. That would greatly help us with attendance, but that's not all. See, at the beginning of the summer, <laughs> we began to realize that even with pushing and packing out our five o'clock service, which I'm already praying in faith, that's gonna happen, okay? With that as well, we would still not be okay until we launch this campus coming up in September over the next couple of of weeks, uh, uh, particularly August 21st and 28th, we would not be okay still, even with packing out that service. We would be somewhere, and these are just projected numbers, but somewhere in the 95 to 99% range of the chairs being filled. And that's just unacceptable. It's going to send that message to new people that we're not intending to send, that there is no room for them here because we know there's going to be room. We launched this campus. Uh, 500 people are going to leave. I know that's going to happen and go to the new campus. And so we have to figure out what to do for the next couple of weeks. And uh, what we've decided to do is open up a 1230 service for two weeks. Okay. So the call is unmistakable here. If you can move to the five o'clock for a season, please do that. If you can't do that, at least try to move to the 1230 uh, for the next couple of weeks to get us through until this new campus launches um, in, in, you know, in September. A couple things are going to happen with this 1230 service, all right? And then I'll get into the sermon. Uh, we're going to have full kids programming, full band, full, I'll be preaching live, the whole deal at 1230. So you come here, it's going to be the same experience as you would get at any other service. So come to the 1230. If you don't, listen to what I just said, the band's going to play live and I'm going to preach live. And if people don't come, we're going to do that to an empty room, okay? And I've done that before. That's awkward. I don't want to do that again. So I hope that you guys uh, will come but secondly, if you don't come, it's not just about being awkward. If you don't come, there just won't be room for new people. It's really as simple as this. Are we as a congregation going to decide that we want the Lord to continue to grow our church or not? Because if we decide we don't want to, then there's a real easy way to do that. We just keep packing up the morning services and tell new people they can go find somewhere else or they can go find nowhere at all, okay? And so I hope that that won't be us. If you can, just, just consider it. I hope you'll, you'll make that move. All right, if you have a copy of scripture, take it out and turn with me to Acts chapter six. We are launching a brand new sort of mini series here today. Uh, we're gonna be in the book of Acts for four weeks and we're gonna be looking at what happens when God is moving in a church, when a church is growing, there are some predictable things that begin to happen. And as we get ready to launch this new campus, and I know a lot of you are going to the campus, a lot of you aren't going to the campus, but as a church, this is what God has before us. We're all sort of in this together. We're all aligned uh, behind this vision of, of the new um, campus launching in, uh, in September in another part of the triad, in, in more downtown kind of central Greensboro. 
So I, I take that to, to, to say and to mean, man, we are in a movement of God. God is growing our church. And if that's true, we can look back to the book of Acts and see some things that are predictable, see some things that we should be able to understand are going to happen. And that's what I want to do through this series for four weeks called Launch. Here's kind of the big idea for the series, not for the sermon, but for the series. When the church grows, what can we expect from God and what is God expecting of us, okay? If we look back to the book of Acts, can we see some formulas of, man, when the church grows, it seems like a few things happen. What can we expect? That's what we want to talk about for the next four weeks. All right, well, what are we going to talk about today? Today, what we're going to talk about is this. In the first place, what we can expect in terms of being in a movement, in terms of God growing our church, which is where we're at, what can we expect? It's very exciting. Ready? In growth, there are problems, okay? There are major problems. Growth creates needs. Growth creates organizational needs. It creates serving needs. Whenever people are coming to faith, whenever there is a joining of a movement, things get more complex, more complicated, more and more needs pop up, more need for leadership, more need for people to serve. And here's the thing, as the church grows, the more pe- as people are coming in, the needs of the church grow, but you know what else grows? The ability for God to use that very church to meet those needs. More people coming to the church means more needs, but guess what? More people coming to the church means more solutions, as people are those solutions, and that's true of anything. Many of you I know are business leaders, or you have maybe been part of uh, growing teams, or maybe you manage something. Uh, if, that's, if that's you, or maybe even if you're like a teacher, I mean, anything that grows, if you just think about it, anything that grows creates more needs, doesn't it? I mean, any any time you've ever built anything in your life, as that thing has grown, there is more needs. And that's true kind of universally. Think about it, especially in maybe an entrepreneurial business uh, scenario. As things grow, there are more needs. But guess what? In that growth is a solution, right? Because in that growth, there's more budget. In that growth, there's more staff that you, it's the same thing that's causing the needs that ends up being the thing that meets the needs. The church is no different. As God sends growth to a church, as it grows, there are more needs, but God can use that very growth in order to meet those needs. And so that's kind of where we find ourselves. It's the same thing that's growing, there's needs, but there's also solutions. This is the big idea that I want you to see today from the book of Acts, all right? Growth generates needs and it is the means to meet those needs. If you weren't growing, you wouldn't have the need. But because you're growing, now you have the solution to meet those needs. God is gonna use that growth in a mighty way. And that growth means people, all right? So people are the solutions. As we grow, church, there are more needs. And I can tell you, I'm going to tell you some of them today, but I am confident today because I know that the solution is in the harvest. God, God, is, God has given us growth that creates needs, but the people that are in this room, the people that will be here all day today, what we need and what we need to meet these, it's already here. It's already in the room. We don't have to look anywhere else. We can look right here, all right? I want to dive into the book of Acts chapter 6, Listen, there's a few things that I want to point out that are a little bit here and there, okay? I can't walk through this passage without pointing a few things out that have just grabbed me um, this week. But when we kind of circle back, what we're going to end up seeing is this big idea that growth creates needs, but it generates the solution, okay? All right, let's dive into Acts chapter 6, and, uh, and let, let's start in verse 1. Now, I told you movement of God. Okay, we're going to see movement of God here. Listen to what it says. In the days when the disciples were increasing in number... That, that's what they were living in. A complaint of the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. I'm going to deal with the Hellenist idea and the daily distribution of the widows in just a second. But look how this passage starts. What was the first line? In those days, the disciples were increasing in number. The passage starts by telling us that there is a movement of God that is happening in the book of Acts. And we know in part, this is not all, But in part, one of the ways that we know that it's a movement of God is because the numbers of disciples are increasing. And man, they really increased, okay? This is a movement that gets kicked off in the book of Acts that is still going on today. If you think about where we are today in terms of a church, we are fruit of this movement 2,000 years later. There's a church planning network out there. We're not part of this church planning network, but I love the name of the church planning network, okay? Um, because the church planning network is called the Acts 29 network. Now, you say, that's weird, Acts 29. There's 28 chapters in the book of Acts. 
And so they call themselves the 29th chapter, meaning that this thing has been rolling for 2,000 years. It's going to continue to roll until Jesus comes back. We are part of the fruit of this, right? Now, it was a huge movement back then. In Acts 6, when we're talking about here, there might have already been 20,000 believers, some have estimated. I mean, this thing was spreading like wildfire. And interestingly enough, the book of Acts really does tout those numbers. And I want you to hear that, okay? I know that our church, uh, we have a lot of millennials in our church. I tell you all the time, I'm an old millennial, okay? But I'm still in that bracket. And I understand from studying about millennials that a lot of times millennials reject the corporate idea. They reject the big box. They don't want to talk about the numbers as if it's something that's evil. Well, we got to get over that. The book of Acts talks about numbers. There are 10 times in the book of Acts where he touts the numbers as evidence of what God is doing in the church. When God is moving in power, the numbers of disciples increase. If someone was to ask me, hey, are you guys all about the numbers? I would say, well, in one sense, no, we're not all about the numbers. I mean, we realize that growth is as much spiritual as anything else. But in another sense, I realize that when God is moving in power, numbers increase in terms of disciples being made. So when I look around, yes, we're all about the numbers. Man, I wanna see more stories. I wanna see more faces. I wanna see more disciples that are being made. Now, when numbers grow, There's issues that grow, okay? When when movements begin, problems begin to pop up. Now, Mercy Hill, I'm about to try to convince you that we have a need and a problem has arisen because of the growth. So are we, you know, what what are we experiencing? And I wanna wanna say this, I'm gonna take the risk because I know some of you are brand new and this could sound brash or proud or even arrogant, but I hope that what you're gonna hear is the things that I'm gonna tell you are so mind-blowing that there is no way this could be in pride because nobody could do this on their own. No group of pastors could do this on their own. Church, Mercy Hill has gifted leaders, but as Pastor Gary Rivers would say, they ain't that gifted, okay? So when I tell you, when I tell you what I'm going to tell you, this is the evidence of the movement of the Lord. Four years ago, this church was 30 people meeting in a house. It was one small group. We had seen no baptisms. We're not even four years in, and we have seen one group go almost to 60, 350 baptisms, including 70 in one day. I could talk about the mission trips that we have sent, the things that we've been able to do in the community, and all of this is because the Lord is growing our church. It can't be something brash, proud, arrogant. I hope that you would see the numbers are so staggering. They ain't that gifted, okay? We're not that gifted. So God is growing the church. Things are moving, but you know what happens? Well, look what happens in Acts. There's a problem. Well, there's going to be problems with us as we grow that we have to address. Here's what it says. A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up the preaching of the word of God to serve tables. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? The pastors, they, they, they see the need, they begin to form a plan. And part of that plan is we can't neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. There is a dichotomy here. There is a ministry of the word versus a ministry of the tables. There's a ministry of the word on one side, a ministry of the tables on the other side. And not to say that we don't uh, swing back and forth, okay? I mean, I think about this, a ministry of the tables idea would be like what we're doing at Clifton Road, I, I, you know, and, and some of the work days that we've done and the pressure washing and cleaning. And I look around and I see many of our staff members that are actually there, they're, they're with the volunteers, they're doing everything right alongside. But, so there's some overlap, but primarily, is that what the pastors do? Is that what they are, to, or, or is there something with the ministry of the word? This is what I want you to hear. Pastors, we can't neglect the word because the ministry of the word is what equips the church to do the ministry of the tables, you see? The tyranny of the urgent can pull all of us from the word. Let me talk about myself as a pastor. I want you then to try to bridge this over and just apply it to your own life, all right? Because there is a context for you in this when you start thinking about word versus table, word versus table. Let me give you my story on it. I learned from my pastor years ago, our pastor at the Summit Church, J.D. Greer, he, told, he said to all of us, and he told me specifically, as we're planning this church, man, guard your mornings. There's going to be people in the church that don't like the fact that you don't take meetings in the morning very often. There's going to be people that don't like that because you're supposed to be on. You're supposed to be a pastor. You're supposed to be willing to meet all this stuff. And he said they can just kind of get over it. <laughs> and the reason is because you have got to continue. You have to not neglect the ministry of the word. 
And he would say this, if you ain't spent 20 hours on the sermon, you didn't do it right. That happens in the mornings. That happens as you begin. And I've heard church planners say before, man, 20 hours. I'm talking about when we were 50 people and there was a million things going on just four years ago. People say, you spend 20 hours on the sermon. They might say to me, I can't afford to spend 20 hours on the sermon. I said, bro, you can't afford not to spend 20 hours on the sermon. Because the word is what's going to equip the ministry of the tables. Now, I know we're not all pastors. I use that as an example for me. But I think about this. How much of our life before God is the tyranny of the urgent pulling us from the ministry of the word in order to get us into the ministry of the tables for all of us in the room? I think about our small group leaders. I mean, how much do you have on you? How much is there expected of you for the health of your small group? But you know what? You gotta be able to let some of those things in your small group be a B or even a C to make sure the ministry of the word is an A+. Because the ministry of the word is going to equip everything else that goes on. All right, now what is actually going on? Let's get into the real issue here. Let me read verse 3. So here's what he says. we got the complaint, against the complaint by the Hellenists against the Hebrews. I'm going to explain that. The pastors come together. We're not going to do, we, we got to do the word. You do the tables. We got to figure this out. We got to make a plan. Verse 3. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good report, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. What is the actual issue that is going on here? Okay, I've kind of danced around it. Here's the actual issue. The poorest in the church were being taken care of by the church, okay? And that, that, should, be true. that should be true of churches and has been true of churches for 2,000 years. If there is a genuine need, and this is what there was, there was a genuine need. The widows of this time would have been in the poorest uh, bracket, nobody to look out for them. And what they're saying is that the daily distribution to make sure they were taken care of, well, the complaint is that the ones that spoke Greek, okay, the Hellenists, one pastor said that his son thought that Hellenists meant the ones who were going to hell, okay? That's not what Hellenist, Hellenist means. Hellenist means Greek speaking. The ones that were in the minority group, they weren't the Hebrews. They were the ones that spoke a different language. They looked a different way. Those people were being left out when they were given food out and, and it seemed like the Hebrews were at the front of the line and maybe they just didn't get any. I want to put this in its most basic form, though it will sting us. This is a racial issue that they are dealing with in Acts chapter 6. This is an issue of the minority being left out from the majority. And I think about that and I think, man, how in the world can this not speak to us? I mean, does this not speak to the church in 2016 in the United States of America? And I'm talking about on both sides because it doesn't matter. Wherever you attend church, usually there is a majority group. And if there is a majority group, no matter which way it goes, there is something for us here. Let me deepen this a little bit, all right? Now, let's think about this idea of the majority group. They're sort of leaving out the, the ones that aren't in the majority. But here's the thing. Every scholar will show you, and, they, and by their actions, they show you the Hebrews majority group. They didn't mean to do this. This was unintentional. It wasn't something that they meant to do. They didn't mean it. They weren't a bunch of racists who didn't like the Greeks. They weren't leaving people out by commission. This is something of omission. It was out of their minds. They didn't quite understand. It was just off the radar. So catch this. If you're the one being left out at the table though, does the intentions of the majority matter very much to you because you still didn't get to eat, <laughs> right? If you're still at the back of the line, it means you didn't eat. How many ways could I apply this? to the church in America, let's just apply this to Mercy Hill Church. Mercy Hill Church, we have prayed and God has answered in some degree that we want to be a diverse church because we believe that that reflects the kingdom of God. To any majority group in any church, but I'm talking about Mercy Hill Church, if there is a majority group in a church, there is the danger to unintentionally leave people out that are not in the majority. So wherever you find yourself on this line as I'm speaking to Mercy Hill, and you can just look around. What am I supposed to, like I've got to say it. I mean, just look around. Wherever you find yourself on the line, of the majority group or out of the majority group. I think there is a word for us here. For the majority group, this is what we need to hear. The answer for unintentionally leaving people out is to intentionally bring them in. It is to bring it to the forefront of our mind, to make sure that in the leadership of our church, to make sure that in the, the serving opportunities at our church and everything else that's going on at our church, to make sure that there are leadership opportunities for the ones that are not in the majority because we always have the ability to leave people behind without realizing it. They didn't mean to, but they did. 
Now, that's what they're going to do. Now, I say leadership. I didn't just pull that out of nowhere. Watch what they do. Look at verse 5. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, uh, your guess is as good as mine, okay, and Nacanor, and Simon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, and a proselyte of Antioch, and these they set before the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on them. You know what this means? All of these names, you know what they are? They're Greek names. You know what they did? Look what they did. They said, man, there is a, a minority position that is being left out of the church. What we have got to do is elevate to leadership people that can advocate for them because we don't understand, obviously, or else we wouldn't have left them out. There's something we couldn't see. And it's almost not even a knock. It's not even a knock on the Hebrews. They couldn't see it. They just didn't see it. But as soon as they saw it, it is a knock on them if they don't respond. So the majority group says, we need people to be brought in. They need to have a voice. We need to incent intentionally seek out those that have, have been unintentionally left out. But you know what? That's not all. Because the other thing I want you to say is this. I said, whatever side of this that you're on, if you're in the majority group, what if you're in the minority group? What is, what is that? In any situation, okay? If you're in the minority, you know what it means? When those that are out of the majority are called, they got to step into leadership. I'm going to talk more about this. I'm going to preach a whole sermon, maybe even multiple sermons on this in our next sermon series as we begin uh, in September to look at creation and what God did in the beginning. We're going to talk about this in our next series. I don't have a whole lot of time to go into it now, but I'm going to go ahead and give you my punchline for this. I believe that the answer for the racially divided church in America is found in Acts chapter 6, and it has to do with leadership that the majority group is creating opportunities and pulling in those that are not in the majority group. And that those that aren't in the majority group want to and are excited about stepping in to those positions. And if churches, are, if, listen, if white churches did that, they'd be more diverse. If black churches did that, they'd be more diverse. Let's just put it like that. And then the whole community would look in and they would see a bunch of churches that look like the kingdom of God. And it would be such a testimony to the world. But there's a bigger picture here that I got to move on to, all right? The bigger picture is this. The bird's eye view is this. There is a formula here that we got to take and apply to the situation that we are in today, Mercy Hill, all right? Here's the formula. The pastors see a need, all right? So the pastors see a need, then the pastors make a plan, and then the church enthusiastically follows through with that plan, okay? So the pastors see the need, and then, the, and then all of a sudden, they, they make a plan. Listen, any plan could probably be better than any, any plan could be better than any other plan. Whatever. This is the plan they make. Really what matters is does the church enthusiastically say amen and follow through. Need, plan, follow through. Now, some of you in the congregation, you may not like that. There might, be some, there might be some here, I don't know church background, where you come from, different polity, the way the church is run and all that kind of stuff. You might not like the way that it's done in the book of Acts. The problem is the way it's done in the book of Acts is going to be the way that it's done here. And the way that it's done in the book of Acts is there is a, there's a need and then the, the pastors see it and they make a plan and the, the church follows them. And if you don't like that, man, some of you say amen to that because you realize how streamlined that is and what the Lord can do in that. And some of you roll your eyes when you hear, oh, the pastors are gonna make a plan and we are supposed to get in line and follow the plan enthusiastically, <laughs> with excitement, with gusto, okay? Because some people might have a critical spirit. Some people might have questioning attitudes. You see this formula and you don't like it. Rather than enthusiastically attack the plan, you might say, man, I wanna just ask questions. Is this, is this, is this relevant? Did they think this through? I mean, it doesn't seem like I like this is a little bit over the top. I don't like this. I don't like that. And suddenly it's question after question after question while the needs of the church go unmet. I would rather serve than ask questions, right? And not, 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 if, not if you can't trust, but if you generally look around at what God is doing at Mercy Hill and you feel like, man, this is a place where I can trust the leadership, then let's go. Then let's go, all right? Now, here, here we go. Verse 7. Let's see what happens. I don't want to harp on this thing about need plan and the following the leaders, but just look what happens when that formula goes. There's a need, there's a plan, and there's a congregation that executes it, and the word of God continued to increase. And the numbers of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. We are the fruit of verse 7. <laughs> 2,000 years later, that's us. 
and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. There's a need, there's a plan, and when it's executed, there is much growth, all right? So here we go, so let's go. Let me apply this to exactly where we are here today. We know this, I got two big ideas. We know this already. When churches grow, they have more needs, right? I've already said that. We see that in the book of Acts. Man, it pops up out of nowhere. There's need for organization. There's need for a plan. There's need for leadership. The church attacks it. Well, what is the need that we have? Are there needs that are coming from our growth? As I said in the intro, this is true of anything, right? A person, a team, a company. As we see today in the, in the book of Acts, uh, the church, as it grows, it becomes more complex and the needs of the church begin to pop up. And as we grow, y'all, that's us, okay? As we grow, there's a need for more group leaders. There's a need for more finances. There's a lot, a lot of needs. But the big one that is right before us, as I think about the fact that we are launching the Clifton Road campus in four weeks, okay? When I said that to our staff the other day, there was an audible like gasp <laughs> in the room. Four weeks away from launching. And what is the need that is great? The need that is great is for more people, more of us in the room right now to move off the sidelines and into the game, to move off the reserves and into active duty in terms of the way that we use volunteer ministries on the weekends, just to get in and let's say, hey, we gotta come together, get more people in the game on the weekends so that we continue to pull off the Mercy Hill experience that we have come to know, okay, and come to love. So here's what I want you to see. Volunteer ministries on the weekends are vital to what we do. And I say that in the truest sense of the word vital. Think about vital, vital organs. You don't do okay without one. That's what vital, that's what vital means. <laughs> when you just boil it down. And we're saying this is vital. If these ministries don't exist on the weekends, the ones that you may take for granted if you don't serve, the ones that you might not even really notice when you come in, if these don't happen, Mercy Hill Church as we know it, the form that we know it in, that God is using to grow, okay, and using to make disciples, that form won't exist in terms of the weekends because without volunteers, you are missing something that is vital. For example, if you try to think about without volunteers, what would parking be like? Some of you are like, man, I've never gone to a place where they make you park in a particular place, okay? Like you have to go to this spot. Well, the reason for that is because the ratio of spots we have versus cars that we come in, if there wasn't somebody to say, hey, you need to go here, we would be in a line for an hour all the way up Bryan Boulevard are trying to get in. But we don't think about that, do we? It's vital to what we do. Being able to get here and park is vital to the weekend ministries. If we don't have a parking crew, that doesn't happen. Without our serve teams, you would walk in and drop your children off. The problem is there would be nobody there. So you would bring them in the service and then they're sitting with you in the service, all 12 of them or whatever. I mean, our church, our families are growing. There's sprinter vans just driving <laughs> everywhere. I love it, okay? So they're all, they're all sitting in here. They're not getting anything out of the sermon. You're not getting anything out of the sermon. Now you might not get out of anything out of the sermon anyway, okay? But I know that our kids do. And the reason is because every Sunday afternoon I ask my kids, what songs did you sing? And they tell me. And I say, what did you learn? And they tell me. What's your memory verse? And they tell me and they act it out and they do their hand motions and they know it. So even if you're not getting anything out of it, they are, but that would stop without serve teams. Without volunteers, you would walk in here, it would be chaos, it wouldn't be welcoming. You would try to sing a song or find a seat. There'd be nobody to click the words on the screen. There'd be nobody to help you sit down. And some of you right now might be super pious, okay? And you're saying, hey, fine, we don't need that stuff anyway. We have Jesus. You sound so much like a fan. A fan don't need all this stuff. A fan could come in, they'd get here an hour early because they're a fan. It's the same reason why you watch the television and these Green Bay Packer nuts, okay, they sit in the stands and 100 below for three hours with no shirts on. Why? Because they're fans. They're willing to do that because they love them. I would never do that in a million years. Don't, I don't give a rip about the Packers. So I wouldn't do it. Here's the thing. We're not trying to reach more fans. We're trying to reach those that aren't fans that wouldn't be willing to stand an hour in parking, that would wanna have their, somewhere that's clean and safe to drop off their kids, that God is doing something in their life and maybe it's the first time they have ever come to a church. There will not be a church that is ready for them if we don't serve. Put yourself in someone else's shoes for just a minute. I want you to imagine not knowing Jesus at all, not being a Christian, something in your life has shaken you up. You decide to try first, uh, try church for the first time or the first time in a long time and you try to pull in and the parking is worse than Chick-fil-A at Friendly Center, okay? <laughs> and then you try to 
You try to drop your kids off, but there's nobody back there. And so all of a sudden you brought your kids into the service and they're going nuts and you feel like everybody's looking at you. And then everybody begins to sing. And all the fans, they know the songs already. They listen to Caleb, right? They, they know it, but you're not a fan. So you don't know. And you come in, everybody's singing songs, but you don't know the words. And so you're just kind of sitting there with your hands in your pockets. Are you going to come back to that church? Or are you going to think, man, something was shaking me up. Something was drawing me. But man, obviously church wasn't the answer. They wanted to find out who Jesus Christ was. But if they come here and there are no serve teams and we are not ready for them, church, it is our way of saying we aren't willing to do what it takes to get the message of the gospel to you in a way that you can understand. And far be it from us to be that way. Maybe you're like, man, I get it, okay? There's a grave need that has arisen from growth, though. All right, and it's not just here at regional. You should be able to probably connect the dots. See, here's the deal. We need to double the amount of volunteers that we have serving at Mercy Hill Church, and we need to do it in four weeks. We praise God that he is growing our church and has enabled us to take a giant step like launching this location, but two locations means us what? It means double the everything. It means everything that happens here has got to be done there. The day the campus launches, we need twice as many people to do everything that we do. Twice as many to park, twice as many kids, twice as many to see, coffee, pray during the service, run the media, music, everything, twice to everything. But you think to yourself, but wait a minute, I'm not going to Clifton, so we're going to be okay here. Actually, just think about it. Do you think the ones that serve here are probably the first ones to answer the call to go to Clifton? They are. <laughs> when a volunteer here decides, I'm going to go to Clifton, it just left a void here. Or when a volunteer says, hey, I live out in Oak Ridge or whatever, I'm, I'm going to stay here. Guess what? It just created a void at Clifton. We've got to double the amount of volunteers that we have. A need has come up from within our church. We aren't trying to double the amount of volunteers that we have. We have to double the amount of volunteers that we have. It, it, it's not just like that we're trying, this is a new initiative. If this doesn't happen, then the way that we do services now will have to change, okay? Because of the voids that are left there when someone stays and the voids that are created here when someone goes, we need a doubling church. But it's not just about the need, right? It's about what God has done. The solution is in the harvest. The second and final point that I want you to see here today is this. When churches grow, they have the people to meet those needs. The answer is right here. The answer is in the room in front of me. Yes, we have a great need, but in growth, God has given us what we need to, in, to, 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 to meet the need. The solution is right here in front of us. I would put it like this, as simply as I can. Growth caused the problem, but growth has solved the problem. Gr growth causes it, but the solution is there. That's the book of Acts. Man, the growth created the tension. There weren't Hellenists in the church before, but now there were. So well, guess what? We got to figure out, are there some leadership Hellenists? Are there some guys that speak Greek? Oh yeah, there are. So let's go and grab them. The solution is right here in the harvest. So I've got I've to push here, all right? This is the part where I've just got to get us, I've got to push a little bit. I have given you the need, but you know what? You know what leadership 101 is? People don't respond to need like you think they would. They respond to vision. That's what people respond to. People respond to when you lay it out before them. People respond to gratitude. They respond to joy. I have given you the need. It won't be enough to move you. You know what should be enough to move you is this. It isn't that somebody else needs you. It's that you ultimately needed somebody else in a big, big way, right? Like we serve because we have been served. Why did the book of Acts have men that would answer the call like this? Because the gospel was on their lips and they realized, man, you need me to serve tables? I mean, Jesus Christ has come and he laid a table out that was his own blood and his own body. I can serve a table. After seeing the table that Jesus Christ has given to me, you needed somebody else to serve you. You think, man, serving in kids, parking cars, I'm a business leader, I have all this education, and you want me to seat people and brew coffee? If serving is beneath us, what do you call it when the creator of the universe decides to wash his disciples' feet? If serving is beneath us, what do you call it when the king of the, of the universe is nailed to a cross because of our sin? We needed somebody to serve us in a supreme way. And Jesus did that. The scripture says he didn't count equality with God something to be grasped. He made himself low. Jesus served us before he calls us to serve anyone else. And this is the way that we serve in gratitude and joy. Listen, it doesn't escape me that a ton of you that are in the room right now already serve. Okay, you serve in the weekends 
or a community group leader that pours out hours of your week for your group. I mean, there are, there are so many of you that serve and you say, well, what is in this sermon for me? Even if it's just that one little sentence, listen, he served you before he called you to serve. This week, whether it's a weekend ministry or your community group or both, go and serve in gratitude. We don't park cars or teach children or welcome people in out of a heart of duty for the Lord. We do it because Jesus has served us and that creates a heart of delight, okay? There is a need in our church for people to serve, but what God has done in our lives is so great that we look at that and we, we realize, man, God, God has served you and he has equipped you to serve others. He served you and he equipped you. So now it's time that we get after. You say, what do you mean equip me? Do you really, you know, we talk about spiritual gifts all the time and I think, we, I think we make it so complicated and there's all these tests and all this kind of stuff. What was the gifting in Acts chapter six? It was the ability to speak Greek. <laughs> that was it. I don't know what the gifting is in your life. There are certainly spiritual giftings, but there are also talents that God has given you. You probably have an eye for detail or you have the ability to learn systems quickly, or maybe you have a warm demeanor. All of these things can be put into play. We gotta stop trying to figure out where to serve and just dive in, okay? So here's what I want you to do. In your seat, when you came, there was a card. I want you to get that card out, all right? It was, you sat right on it. I just want you to look at it. I want, we're gonna talk about both sides of it, and that's gonna be my time, and then I'm done. The side that I want you to look at first is the side that is called the weekender side. Okay, so if you, if you look at it, it's the white side of that card that you have. Take that card out. The weekender is the open door for you to get in to serving at Mercy Hill Church. And you say, man, what is the weekender? The weekender is where you come and we get to lay the church open, show you everything that we do. We want you to see what God has done here and what he is doing here. The weekender is a Friday night, Saturday morning, and a Sunday morning serve opportunity called on ramp. And you say, well, I, you say, man, I don't know. I, I can't do the weekender, but I, I definitely want to serve. It doesn't work like that. We need you to see the vision before we ask you to serve out of the vision. So we need you to come to the weekender. And there is a weekender, it just happens to be, right? There is a weekender happening this very weekend. Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, come to the weekender, sign up today. You're like, man, I wanna come, I just can't come, something crazy like I really can't come, I'm in a wedding. I promise you the bride is gonna understand that you, the maid of honor, still can't come to the wedding, okay? She's gonna get it because of how much we got going on here. I'm only sort of joking, if there is a way that you can get out of whatever it is that you have, listen, if there's any way that you can be here, you can make it happen. You can move things around. You can be here. I'm praying for the biggest weekender that we have ever had in the history of this church. Even though it's a week away, I pray that this will happen. Man, and if you're like, I really just can't, well, then you know what? There are weekenders every single month. That's why we do that. Okay, so get out. Make sure you attend one this fall. But there's a ton of you out there, a huge percentage actually, that have come through the weekender, or maybe it goes all the way back to before the weekender when we were doing our next step class or whatever it was. You have come through that class before. Take that card and turn it over. I want everybody to, to be able to see this, okay? The next part of that card is called the on-ramp portion. What that is, is the Sunday portion of the weekender. It's the place where we go, let us give you the vision on Friday. Let us give you the vision on Saturday. Now let us give you a hands-on opportunity to follow and shadow and jump into a serve opportunity on Sunday. Here's the deal. I understand that a lot of you have come through the weekender you came to the on-ramp, okay, on Sunday portion, you jumped in and then you were there for two weeks and then life happened. And something happened and you fell out. And you know what, I don't know what it was, but I know this, there's an on-ramp on Sunday. There's a way to get back in. If God is pulling you, if he is drawing you, there's a way for you to get back in. Maybe you came to the weekender and when you were there, you were listening to it and, and you came in and you were like, man, the, a lot of the serve teams have to commit for a long time. It's not that way anymore. Maybe the weekender, you right now we're asking for a provisional commitment. Everybody that comes in, we're like, hey, come and commit for 60 days. Because I believe if you commit for 60 days, you are gonna see the supreme value in serving on the weekends and what it does in the life of others. If you can get in here for 60 days, I believe that you're gonna to wanna to stick. And so come try it out, come jump in. Maybe in the on-ramp you came and you felt like everything was running so well. You looked around at all the people and all the serve teams and you're like, man, they don't need me. You know what? It was probably debatable then, it ain't debatable now. We need you now. Two locations means double the amount of volunteers. So I pray that you will sign up, okay? We're gonna have a video after this. It's gonna be as clear as it can be. 
I pray that during uh, the rest of this service, you're going to sign up for one of those. If you haven't been to a weekender, let's go. If you have been, but you fell out of serving, maybe you can sign up for the on-ramp. You just come on Sunday, that's it, and you get plugged right back in, all right? Let me close with this. In life, there is always opportunities to look for an investment where you get a good return, right? Don't we all want to do that? I mean, with, ev- with everything in your life, uh, with your money, with your energy, you know, you want to look for that place where you can invest $10 and get $100 back. You want to look for that place where you can invest a little bit of energy and get a huge return. You know, some examples of that. Think, think about this. You know, it's, it's only like an hour of the day, but like when a dad gets home, he's been gone all day at work. He gets home, bunch of kids at the house, and he walks in the door and he's like, hey, the older ones, let me just take, let me take, all, let me take the kids out for an hour. I'll have them outside. You can just not worry about it. It's only an hour of your day. There's 24 hours. <laughs> but that one hour is a $10 investment, $100 reward, right? Because for your wife, that hour is different than all the other hours. She needs that at that time. It's an incredible investment of your time. It's only an hour. Hours are hours. But it's a very important one. You see, it's, it's an investment. What I want you to see is that when we think about serving on the weekends, it's not a huge commitment of time, an hour, hour and a half. Man, in the course of your week, most of you have played Pokemon Go for more than that in a day, okay? Or you've been watching Michael Phelps win every you know, medal there is in the world all week. I mean, you, you know, an hour and a half in a week? But it's one of those places where you invest 10 and there's a hundred dollar reward. There's a hundred that comes back to you because it's the right place. Because you know what? Every single time you come, you know how I know that? Here's how I know that. Hour and a half investment, not huge, once a week. I was talking to one of our pastors, Brian Miller, his son Drew, three years old. He said, you know what, man? He said, unprompted from us. Do you know that Drew prays for his teachers and kids every single night of the week? Unprompted. They're with him for an hour and a half. But that's where he, wa- he wants to pray for them. Why? Because they're making a monumental impact on his life. They are shaping disciples in the next generation. They're creating missionaries over there. Hour and a half. That's it. You think, man, like, okay, I get it. We need people to serve and all that. People don't serve out of need. I want you to see the need, but this is why you need to serve. You know why? Because when there's a welcoming environment, somebody like Meg shows up. Meg sent me her story this week. You know what Meg's story was? She was raised in a home that was hostile to the gospel. I mean, like, hostile. God's calling her her whole life. 13 years old, she gets, a, she gets a Bible, even to the chagrin of her parents. Like, oh my gosh, they're just so... And she reads the whole Bible. 13. 17 years old, she gets a car. The first thing she does is go to a church. She has no background, no, no clue of going to what a church. She just shows up at one. But you know what? She gets in college and all of that is stolen. And for all of her college years, she just kind of lives a typical college life. She falls back in line with her parents' philosophy that there is no God. You live, you die, that's it. And she meets some people in Wake Forest, North Carolina that begin to push her to Jesus. She starts thinking about the gospel more. And when she gets over here, you know what they told her? They said, when you get to Greensboro, you go to Mercy Hill Church. Listen, they will be ready for you. They will have prepared for you. People just like you that are searching. She comes to this church within two or three weeks. She becomes a believer, gets in a weekender, now being discipled. When she came her first time, you know what she found? She found a church that was ready for her. I mean, you could be part of that. And I pray that you will. Sign up for the weekend or sign up for the on-ramp. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, God. And we thank you that you have given us ample opportunities to serve and to use our talents and gifts. Father, I pray, Lord, that the people of our church would just respond, that there would be an outpouring. God, draw us, pull us. God, we want to look for those places where we can invest in your kingdom and in those places where there is great reward. Father, I pray that you will convince the people in this congregation that this is one of those. God, it will prompt them to action. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.